Hey there, soccer freaks. This is ATL on Fire, the podcast where we talk all things Atlanta United Football Club. So sit back, buckle up, enjoy. like the show tell a friend all right welcome back everybody we are here with the fire dave it's been a long year we're at the end of it thanks for joining good to be here as usual it's good to see the fire back yeah um it's definitely been cold the last couple days so this thing has been pretty much running non-stop at the house i can almost feel it through the zoom screen yeah um so how uh how's your off time been are you been been taking a break from work or yeah a little bit a little bit uh, we're working on our we're working on our wine there you go we so, actually, hey. actually just bottled our first vintage sweet so, so is, that, when, is that what you're drinking tonight um no because uh you know probably you should stay in the bottle for a while i, I think you know as as atlanta united heads to what will hopefully be a strong playoff run in 2021. Uh, we'll have uh, a bottle of uh, our Emerald Hill Winery Norton um, to celebrate. Yum. So at, you, at the moment, I, I'm drinking an, uh, an Australian Shiraz. Oh, very nice. I have disappointed you and I've moved on to Scotch, which is a <laughs> Glen Morangi, I think, uh, Quinta Ruban. Tasty. Kind of nice with the fire here. Very nice. So we got, well, you know, it's, it's COVID times. You got to do what you got to do, right? No doubt. <laughs> the whiskey helps uh, prevent it. So, um, <laughs> yeah, we finally have a new coach. We do. And that's the big news. That's the big news. Um, we haven't done a podcast in two or three months, but really hasn't been a whole lot to talk about. We played club America. we, ended the season on a fizz and um you know it's kind of nice to have a little mental break and now we've got something exciting in my mind to talk about which is uh, a coach in in all the selection options out there i felt was a good choice gabrielle well, heinza yeah well what i what i would say is maybe we should start by saying i think this finally puts to bed the whole shenanigans about how could we go that long without having a permanent coach? And I think the answer is, as, as you and I had talked about on a, a long time ago on a podcast, is that Frank DeBoer left us in the lurch. He, maybe we were thinking about parting ways with him or whatever, but he saw an opportunity to jump to the Dutch national team. He took it. Um, and so we were left a bit in the lurch and they probably started the search immediately, had Heinze in mind because he was available then, but, um, you know, as we can maybe talk about, um, Heinz, uh, the negotiations and the discussion went on for a very long time. And so that actually finally makes some sense for why there was no, <clears throat> you know, there was an interim coach for so long and there was no talk about a new coach and there was just nothing going on. I would have liked though to, you know, to be fair, uh, I would have liked the club, Darren Eels and, and Boca Negra, to have told us that, look, the search is underway. Um, they could have told us that. Well, yeah, I mean, I think they said the, the search was underway. And, and I think the, the key was, is to your point, I think, I think maybe they had Gabriel Heinze. He, is it Heinze? I think that's the, the right pronunciation. Um, or Heinze. I think it's Heinze. Oh, look at that. That was Oh, some fire it's there. more Heinz, but you know, I mean, it well, depends, I guess, the, the if reason you're I, authentic Spanish speaker or not. I think it's Heinz which, A which because I was listening to the introduction um, on uh, the, the official uh, broadcast where they interviewed him the other day, and the guy that did, did the introductions pronu pronounced it Heinz A, and I assume he was okay. probably coached into that a little bit. Um, so I that listened was, to that too, but I just I didn't make a I didn't make a note of that. Um, but. The, the thing I believe that, you know, prevented them from making it official before it leaked a, a month before they made it official was the fact that 
if they had him targeted, um, apparently, even though he hadn't been coaching his previous team, he was still under contract through 2020. So I think they wanted to get towards the end of his contract to make sure there was no, you know, bad looks from them being a little premature. You know, a lot can happen in a year of, of COVID with him maybe being committed in July and a lot changes in, in four months with family or whatever the situation may be. So I think the front office was probably wisely a little guarded maybe in saying, hey, we've got our guy, but we got to wait until, you know, the end of the year before we can announce it. I think in England they call that a tapping up where yeah. you uh, contact a player just under the radar, you know, before you're allowed to just to feel them out. Yeah, and um, I, I only listened to a, few, a little bit of the the interviews with uh, with him. Um, you know, it's definitely interesting to see people's um, facial expressions and their emotions as a kind of a first key of of what their personality is going to be like in the locker room and or how their personality is with the media, however you want to look at it. Uh, but what what were your first impressions with just kind of his demeanor and um, and and the choice in general? Well, you know, the interesting thing is that, um, you know, his press conference was totally stone-faced. I, I know Heinze for for, uh, or Heinze, uh, for a long time because uh, as a Man United fan, you know, he played left back for us a long time ago under Alex Ferguson. So I've known him a very long time, have followed his entire career, even after he left Man United and went on to Paris Saint-Germain and Real Madrid, um, you know, so I've known him a, a very long time. I've been aware of him. Um, and as, as, as Alex Ferguson was apparently quoted as saying, um, you know, he'll do anything to win. You know, he'll kick your grandmother. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> Which, if he has to. <laughs> um, and, so. and, you know, his, his uh, general coaching stint has only been what, four years in Argentinian football. Is that right? Correct. And yeah, so he coached uh, just to, to give a recap. So he coached, um, uh, down. So he coached for the, uh, the juniors in the second division. Um, and um, they got promoted actually in his first season, um, oh. which was very impressive. Um, that was the, um, the Argentinos juniors, uh, uh, sorry for the delay. I, I'm not that familiar with the Argentinian second division clubs. That's for sure. Um, so he coached the Argentina juniors for the, for a year, got them promoted and then moved to Vélez Sarsfield, um, which is not one of the really, really big clubs, um, but is also not a, a tiny club. They've actually won titles, but not any time in recent history. Um, and they had been really down for a long time. Um, and he did really well in, in the two years he was there. Both years they qualified for what would be, you know, the, the Champions League in Europe, um, okay. the Copa Libertadores. So the, it's a pretty successful run. Um, you might be ask yourself, like, why did he step down? You know, because he, he, he parted with the club. The club didn't fire him. Hmm. He left. Um, and it was rumored that he was leaving to move on to, to bigger and better things, but it's a little bit, you know, maybe odd to leave. I don't know. I don't, it's not, it's not clear to me why he left without having a job already, for example. Right. Um, but. Yeah. And I mean, I don't get the sense either that he's a, a long-term fit here. What was the contract with him? Two years, two, two years. Yeah. So, you know, my gut would say that's probably where his head is at making a run at, at whether it was another stepping stone for him to go to Europe. If that, you know, maybe he got stonewalled in the, the process on some places that he thought he might be able to go after that. I don't know. Um, but. So the, the rumors were that he was offered one, at least one job in Europe at Marseille, which is a pretty yeah. big club in France. And that he was also, um, offered Palmeiras, which is um, a tremendous club in South America, um, in Brazil. Hmm. Um, so he had offers for major yeah. things and apparently turned those down, um, and but didn't turn us down. Yeah, that's well. I'll take it. 
Um, so, pretty- you know, the interesting thing is the story goes, you know, having read up a little bit about the things is that, you know, there's the, the famous story with, with Tata, right, that Darren Eels and and um, and Boca Negra went down there figuring that Tata was just going to give them a token sort of interview. Um, and when they showed up, he had a whole notebook uh, which had a whole analysis of all of MLS and a couple of players he wanted um, from MLS and a couple of players that he wanted um, from South America, like Al Marone. Um, and he said, if you can give me those players and you're willing to do it, I'm in, which was, you know, it's kind of floored them. And the follow-up to that is sort of um, apparently – Heinz was, you know, one of the reasons that it was put on hold for a while, um, aside from the contract issue, is that um, he said that he needed time to do an analysis of both the Atlanta United team and the MLS. And apparently when they finally went down to Argentina, he had actually evaluated ev- not so much MLS like Tata did, because, of course, Tata, there was no team. Yeah. Um, but he had actually analyzed every single one of the current Atlanta United players, including the Atlanta United twos and the, all the junior players. Mm. Um, and he had a, a, an evaluation of every single one of them. That's awesome um, to hear. I didn't, where did you, uh, where did you come across that? Uh, I'm not sure whose article it was. It wasn't one of the major articles. Maybe it was the MLS article, but okay. uh, I'm not sure. But, yeah. you know, I mean, you know, you can say, well, maybe that's PR stuff, you know, because it worked so much with Tata. But the, 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 the thing that made me believe that that was actually true is that it wasn't really talking about him having evaluated MLS or this and that. It was really, really focused not on a team, but but on a lot of the youngsters. And he actually had asked about particular youngsters that he could maybe, you know, move into the first team. Yeah. And I, um, as far as, you know, his his familiarity with some of the players didn't he play with Escobar or coach him at some point was in there some history there yeah well you know he played um at the very end of his career I mean he played for a very long time and he ended up back um in Argentina a new old uh, where boys he's originally and... from at new old boys where he played for Tata Martino um and he played also with Escobar oh. so, I mean Escobar literally made his like first appearance right. You know, they, they overlap like very, very little, but um, they did overlap. Still, yeah, I mean, I think the, I think the pick, obviously, in terms of culture is, is helpful there, given obvious, you know, large number of Argentinians we have on the team. Um, the style of play, evidently, and I know you've done some analysis on this, is more of an attacking style. Um, maybe not as attacking as Tata, but the numbers bear out at least – favorable in terms of, uh, you know, the ratio there in terms of being attack minded, you know, it's, you know, from what I've read as well, you know, Bielsa is a bit of a mentor for him in at least a philosophical sense of how he likes to play. He's a defensive player, but he was always a defensive player, at least from my memory that got up the field um, was able to, you know, not in some headers, you know, and be aggressive going forward, kind of like, um, you know, the defenders that I like to see, you know, making those overlapping kind of, Runs into the ball. Yeah, he was a very attack minded at Manchester United. He was a very attack minded left back, um, overlapped all the time and was very offensive. Towards the as he got a little bit older in his career, he played center back like at Real Madrid and things. But, um, you know, that's natural. But it actually shows you a command of not only being aggressive as an attacking player, but also, you know, tactically to be able to center back. I mean, a center, there are not too many people, you know, you would think that many, many of the outside backs as they got a little older would naturally gravitate to center back. You very rarely see it because it requires different skill sets. The center backs much more reading the game and whatever, and the outside backs a lot more one-on-one athletic, you know, good foot skills things. Right. Um, So in terms of, you know, the grade on picking Heinze, what would you say in terms of, you know, one through 10 and who, who, if anyone, would you have rather seen as a signing? Well, you know, I was pretty flummoxed about who we would, who who we could get and who we would get. Um, I'm going to put it very high, like nine and I, and hopefully over the next little bit, I'll, I'll be able to elaborate on that. You know, when I, 
it's interesting. So Darren Yells and Boca Negra said, oh, we've gotten, uh, you know, a real attack-minded coach. You know, we're going to go back away from DeBoer. Keep in mind, they kind of said the same thing when they hired DeBoer. So their track record there is not very good. Um, and then they said, oh, yeah, but he's a, a, a Viesla's, uh, you know, protege who's a very attack-minded coach, um, high-pressing style or whatever. Um I was very skeptical of that. And so one of the things that I did immediately, you know, I, I have said on this podcast over and over, you are what your record is. And so I went back and not only looked at, you know, his record in terms of getting promoted the one year and then doing really well with a not such a great side um, the next two years. Uh, I wanted to look at the goals for and goals against, right? Does it really bear out that he is a really attack minded um, coach? And the answer is no. Um, it doesn't bear out. Um, so Tata, for example, over his career with multiple teams, um, coming into Atlanta United, his teams almost always scored over two goals a game, and they gave up about a goal a game. Anytime you have a one goal differential for a long time career, it's a, remarkable because keep in mind, usually when you take over a team, they're not so good. You have a, you know, it takes time and all these things. So that that kills your average. You have to really be scoring way more than two goals a game to average two goals a game, um, et cetera. So, you know, so Tata, it really bears out that he came in as a guy with a track record of scoring a lot of goals, conceding, you know, decent amount, not good defensively, but not phenomenal defensively, real attack minded coach. Um, Heinze does not, his record doesn't say that. So his, he's much, much closer to scoring uh, 1.3 1.4 not even a goal and a half really um, and his defensive record is much more outstanding it's conceding 0.5 goals per game so he has the same one goal differential that Tata did which is very impressive um, but it's not at all the same record um, and so I sort of said you know I'm calling BS on, on Boca Negra and Eels because I don't have any faith in them after DeBoer, not in terms of picking people, but in terms of them telling us who, what kind of coach they are. And this whole thing about, oh, yeah, he's from the Bielsa, you know, lineage and whatever, which is what Tata was from, um, sounded to me really contrived. And to be fair, Heinze totally shot that down in the opening press oh, conference. Okay. They, asked, they asked him, they said, all right, you know, do you coach like Tata? Do you coach like Bielsa? Are you from that lineage? And he and they said, have you talked to Tata about the team? And he said, no, I didn't talk to Tata yeah. about the team. I don't really know Tata. Yeah. He's like, I played I for him for part. one year. Yeah. yeah. And then he said, and they said, you know, as far as influences, you know, he's like, I'm not a Bielsa coach. I'm not a Tata coach. I'm a Heinze coach, right? Which is I have taken from all of these different coaches that he has played for. And he's like, my philosophy is based on all the things that I've learned over time. And it doesn't come from any one coach which I thought was awesome because this whole idea, even DeBoer who was like, Oh, the Dutch IX system or whatever. I, you know, to me, I like guys to be really confident in their own style. And he came in and it was like, this is what he did. But, um, and I'll, uh, I can go into this more if you ask some questions, but I actually think, you know, the caveat to the goals that for and goals against is that look, he, play you know he was coaching a side that just got promoted for the first time ever and then he was coaching a side in Velas, which is a large part of his record which was not a great side trying to get into the upper echelon and you don't typically get into the upper echelon by playing you know super attacking football you don't have the players for it so you kind of wonder and so i actually went back and i watched um, a number of footage from the Velas sides that heinze coached uh, and I have a very different perspective on the, on him as a coach after doing that. Hmm. Yeah. And I mean, deep down, I think the board, you know, philosophically is a attack minded coach, which with Atlanta United was, was going to be more of a progression. And you saw a little bit of that starting to work out in 2019, where you're playing that system of possession, 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 and then, you know, you, you get it into the box and then you try to, you know, you know, when they get it, you know, push it out that you're kind of just keeping that pressure on. And it's a, it was a totally different style than Tata. 
but that very much kind of possession based football where you're pressing in their side of the field. But I just don't think the the talent level that DeBoer had was sustainable through it certainly 2020. Um, but it's, it felt like, yeah, with a lot of the players leaving and, and a lot of the young, younger players coming in a lot of turnover that, you know, that, that was going to be hard with, you know, a team that wasn't as consistent like Ajax where, you know, you can do that with, you know, players that are coming up through the system. They know exactly what the style is that uh, creates that, that over a course of years. And so it's one thing to be attack minded. It's the other thing to have the right system kind of set up with the right talent to be able to do it. So do you think that Heinze has the right players right now to take over this team? And the fact that it doesn't seem like he's been involved in the recent signings, um, even some of the fullbacks that I think have been signed recently probably didn't have any input on that. And, you know, what are your thoughts there in terms of him being able to shape a team? I have to imagine he had some input because they've been talking with him for so long, but yeah, no, it also seems like, and he made a comment about this in the press conference that he doesn't, you know, he gives advice or whatever, but he doesn't pick the players. They have a, you know, a team in place to pick the players, which is Boca Negra and Eels. But um yeah, um, I think that one thing that happens when you have a team that performs poorly like the Atlanta United did under glass uh, is you get a reputation about you are who your record is. And so people say your record's terrible, that the, the players are terrible. Um I really, uh, I hate to say it, but I really think that Glass was a really poor coach. I mean, and I hate to say it because I think he's a really nice guy and all these things, but I actually, I don't usually say this, but I think that he actually underperformed even the team. Um, I think the team, I think that, that Eels and Bocanegra made some mistakes. They got a lot of guys who were, you know, sort of just athletic and not necessarily great players. I think they're they're in the process of backtracking on some of those players, which is, I think, a good thing. Um, but I also think, I mean, if you look um, along the back line, for example, I mean, Escobar is first class. Um, you know, the center back pairing is first class. Um you know, I think Remedy under Tata was a great defensive midfielder. There, you know, if you consider um, Barco and you consider, you know, our new designated player, Marcelo, or Marcelino, um, it seems like the team, it's not clear to me whether the team is, you know, the class of the MLS kind of thing. But there is zero way that that team in an expanded playoff format should not have easily walked into the playoffs, including with the Martinez injury. Yeah. <clears throat> so what do you think the first change we're going to see in the style of play will be? Or what are you hoping will be the change in style of play come 2021? Well, you know, I mean, you know, glass. Are we talking from glass or DeBoer? I guess we have to compare. Yeah, to sorry, glass. I'm I'm jumping back to to uh, Heinze. That if you yeah, but I mean, were, are you comparing it to glass? Or are you comparing it to DeBoer or both? Um, like in terms of a change. Yeah, I mean, I think all of the above. I mean, I think in terms of a style of play that you would like to see established with the talent that we have regardless of Glass's record and what his approach was? And what are the things that you – some even simple changes you'd like to, to see with maybe configuration of our existing talent, um, the, the, way, the way that we play out of the back, the way that we move the ball through the midfield, what, whatever it may be, getting rid of Adam Jean, whatever it may be. Uh, <laughs> just saying. Well, so, you know, as, as we've talked about a lot, I think the game of soccer, no matter what you do tactically – is about spacing. It's about uh, movement, right? If you have good spacing and good movement, um, you can create things, but you have to be able to do that with a balance, um, you know? And so the, the key is to be able to have those things um, and not get, you know, just penalized the moment you lose the ball. We often talked about with DeBoer how, you know, the outside backs would go forward no matter what, just, just 
And it's funny because Tata Martino initiated that. It was his thing, the outside backs going. But it was a very different thing. In the Tata system, the outside backs would go when it's on. In the De Boer system, the outside backs would go every single time regardless. And so what happened was there was no movement. All they ended up doing was running up and standing there. So they actually ended up closing the space and creating less offense and less movement. Yeah. Um, and I think that, you know, Glass was a little bit that way too. You know, he kept saying, oh, well, you know, we're going to get let people go forward. You know, so yes, people were going forward. He had a lot of commitment to going forward, but there was absolutely zero movement. When you have, you can put nine players forward and if they are standing forward, um, it'll never work. I mean, you, uh, you know, you've played for a long time, right? If you play, you probably remember your coaches doing this. If you play like half field, like, you know, um, just offense, defense on half field, and you put the fullbacks in position and you put the attackers in position, right? The offense almost never scores. And the coaches get so frustrated doing it because they're like, well, why isn't the offense scoring? And the reason is when you start with half field and you start with those players in the position or whatever, there's zero movement. The defense doesn't have to react to anything. They're already in place. The offense is already in place and you, you, you don't get any movement, right? You know, whereas Tata, for example, you had those guys going, you had Almiron going through the middle, you know, some of those counterattacks that they had, they had, you know, Almiron dribbling through the ball. Martinez is making a run off him. He had players out wide. He had, you know, Gressel, you know, overlapping and all of a sudden there were options everywhere. So, um, you know, one of the things that I, was really impressed by when I was watching Velez videos under Heinze. That's the club that he coached in Argentina. Um, they had tremendous spacing and movement. Um, and so it makes me believe that, that maybe he is an attack minded coach and maybe they just didn't score that much because of the, the squad who they had. Yeah. Um, yeah. And your, your example there is definitely, definitely true. And I, I think, you know, one of the things you said in one of the previous podcasts, I remember well, too, because you were talking about the, the different types of crosses, right? And there's one that's everybody is running one direction, basically, including the defense, everybody is like retreating, and then the offense is going down, and then you, you know, you get these, you know, is the Gressel cross that is the perfect example. And the reason that was successful is when that was happening, it was he's breaking down the line, the defense were moving into their half at that point at a rapid pace. And that ball comes into space early and, you know, with hopefully a good, good swerve to it versus to your point, if the team and you know, almost all 22 players are in one side of the field, you almost um, have to have somebody like, you know, uh, hopefully who's the, who's the young Mexican uh, guy on the, the wing. He did it. Dam, Jurgen Dam. Yeah. Jurgen Dam was pretty, you have, you have to go to the, the end line and almost play it back for it to be a successful cross. Uh, in in those situations where everybody is kind of again a little bit st more stagnant, just because there's so many players. To your point, you have to create a angle, and that tends to be that type of cross that, uh, at least in a crossing a attack mode, that's going to be successful. And you know, someone who's got a player like uh, Andama Traore for like the Wolves, who can almost always get a step on someone that could be a part of your play. You bring it in, you, you have control, but you have to have the right pieces to be able to play that style of play. If, if that's going to be your offensive, you know, uh, mindset, but it has to be both and no doubt. So, but anyway, I always love that example of, of the two types of crosses because there's that kind of stagnant cross uh, that's ineffective. Uh, there's the, you know, attacking everybody's on their back foot. And then there's one, you know, where you basically have to go to the end line to, to, to make the angle. So, so it, maybe it's there's the three. rhythm, the rhythm and the expectation of the team, right? So if you, if a guy goes and he makes, you know, three cutbacks along the side to beat the outside back and he crosses the ball, sometimes it could be the most amazing cross in the, in the world, right? You know, he freed himself and he made a beautiful cross. It's right would be someone's head. You're never going to score on it because by the time you've made the three cutback moves, everybody in the box has already arrived. They're standing there. They're completely stagnant, right? And not to say you never score, but your chances to scoring are way diminished because if you're going to score, you need a cross while the people are running in. And that's the way you score, right? And the same thing is true defensively. Um, 
you know, it's, it's expectations, right? So defensively, it is really, really important that people know what is the other players are doing. So offensively, if you're a forward, right, you make that run anticipating the cross from Jurgen Dam, And if he doesn't deliver it, you're just screwed. You've already made the run into the box and, you know, you can kind of recycle through, but it's, it's difficult. Right. You're just stuck. And so, so if you're, if you're uh, Adam Jean, for example, and you're like, he gets a beautiful service, but it's not in rhythm. And then he tries to score and he kind of heads it weakly to the goalkeeper. And you're like, well, why is he terrible? Well, it, a lot of times it could be the crosser's responsibility if they never crossed it in rhythm and he ends up standing around, even the greatest you know, player is not going to score. The same thing is true defensively. So the expectation, right. You know, it, it drives me crazy. The announcers, um, glass had this a little bit you know oh let's get our bank of four in the midfielder you know it's really organized and whatever and you're like okay but where are the players you're marking right so if you have a bank of four or two banks of four as they say a back four and a midfield four and it's really looks really well organized and yes that's a little bit hard to break down because you got to pass it in between but the moment somebody gets beat in that kind of a system, so let's say somebody dribbles by a midfielder and is now running at the back four, right? Then people have to make a decision, right? And if nobody knows what the decision is, then you're in trouble. And this is what you found with Atlanta United under glass all the time, which is the players sort of had a zonal kind of whatever system and somebody would come through and they didn't know whether it was Robinson or Mesa was supposed to step or Baylor was supposed to step. And a lot of times two of them would step or three of them would step. And sometimes nobody would step. Right. So what what's really, really important, if you have instead of having just complete zonal kind of capabilities, if you have some man to man and some zone now, suddenly, you know that, OK, you know, Remedy's going to, as Tata had, Remedy's going to mark somebody up in the midfield, right? And of the backs, you know, one of the two backs, Mesa's going to mark up if he's the close guy, and let's say Robinson is not. So if Remedy gets beat on that one-on-one, -on -one, the free guy is Robinson, and he knows, he already knows that Mesa's marking, and he's going to stay, and I'm going to step. And so people say, oh, it's communication or whatever, and you have to communicate. But when the decisions are simplified, then people make the better decisions faster all the time. And the defense is way better. So bringing an example forward though, you know, when it's going to be a coach that's successful to bring simple changes like that in terms of a philosophy of um, what you're just talking about there, where people understand what their responsibilities are on the defensive side, where we saw many times it, it break down. Um, when, when teams are coming and attacking our, our defense, which on paper should be one of the best defensive lines uh, in the MLS, uh, but certainly did not look, look that way many times, even with a veteran like Mesa in the back, who I think is a phenomenal player. Uh, I think it, it does show that there is not good top-down communication, what the plan is. And so if you're, you know, expecting something from uh, Gabriel Heinze uh, that he is going to instill uh, what what do you what do you think the the few things that he's going to try to do would be? Well, you know, so the thing that I saw in the videos that go, you know, so one of the things that that Tata did that I could never, and and I don't think Tata was a great defensive coach. I think he's a good defensive coach. He's an excellent attacking coach. Um, but one of the things that he did is he just simplified everything. And he said, okay, Remedy, you're going to sit in front of the back four. And before that, he had Carmona in his first year who he really wanted to sign, right? And in both cases, he's like, okay, your job is to pick somebody up, their most attacking, you know, midfielder or whatever. And then the other guys who are there, the Almarones and then later the, the Nogbees, right? Your job is to pick up off of them. Right. So if you have that and Remedy's always got the first one. So first of all, it means that the guy who gets the first pass is not wide open. He tends to be shut down. Right. There could be other guys open, but at least the first pass to one guy is shut down. And now all you have to have is Al Marone and Nogby or whoever working hard to get back, which they do. Barco works really hard to get back. Right. Because then they can swarm around the ball and win it. This so-called, you know, high press 
doesn't work one iota if you don't have that first pass um you know covered because then you know if they're trying to build out of the back you have high press you got Jurgen Dan working super hard or whatever and they just make a pass to open guy in the midfield it's just wasted energy right so um what i think what i liked about Velez is when he when i was watching those games is Instead of having the, you know, universal midfield, he clearly had one guy whose job was to anchor the midfield and to sit. And that's what Tata did with originally with Carmona and then later with Remedy. And I could never understand DeBoer wanted to play total football or whatever. And he had Remedy sometimes running forward in front of Nogby and Nogby was forward and, and then later Hindeman was forward, right? And it was very fluent or whatever. But when we turned the ball over, a lot of times they looked around and they were scrambling. And so as good as Meza and Robinson are in the back, when people are just running right through the midfield, when that first pass is on, yeah. it doesn't matter how good you are. You're going to be in trouble. Yeah, no. And th- you felt like you saw that so many times last year, even, even with the bore um, that seemed to be a little bit of what was happening. So it was interesting how, Again, nothing really changed with glass um, when it when it came to some of those same issues. So jump into well, you know the interesting thing about De Boer is De Boer's solution to that. I mean, De Boer I think understood that as a defender. His solution to that was perfect football. If you never make a mistake and you never turn the ball over and you're careful with the ball, then it doesn't matter if that guy is open initially on the pass. But the problem with that is that a our players are not good enough to do that. But it also ends up leading to stagnation because people are so worried about making a mistake. Instead of trying the 30-yard the ball through the middle that might break it open to Martinez that you saw under Tata from Al Marone, for example, um, you know, instead of trying that, we saw a lot of times the players, if it wasn't maybe perfect on, they would pull it back and play it backwards because DeBoer didn't want to turn the ball over because he knew the guys weren't marked. And he was like, look, we can control the game. But I'd much rather see those players be given the opportunity to try something, maybe turn it over. But then the next time it goes through and suddenly Martinez is on goal and scores, right? How is Martinez recovery doing, by the way? Do you think we're going to see him uh, in the spring at all? Or are they going to really wait wait it out? Everything I've heard is that he is going to be ready to go for the season, hmm. um, which, which, you know, makes sense. Right. So he injured it um, in the spring, right? It was like it was, February, March, right? Yeah. February, March. And people say you can come back technically in six months, mm-hmm. but most people are closer to, you know, nine months, maybe yeah. even a year, but you know, we're not kicking off until February. So by that point he'll be, you know, at least a good 10 months. Um, and so maybe they'll ease him in a little bit at the beginning, but the, the expectation is that he's ready to go. Yeah. Cause I've only seen a few clips of him, you know, doing a little, you know, juggling drills or whatnot, volleying drills and, you know, seems, seems like they're taking it slow, which is good. Definitely would rather that course uh, be, be the way to go. Um, so why don't we talk about the last game that we saw from Atlanta United in 2020, which ended up at least being a win, but really in aggregate a, a big loss. Um, certainly because of the situation that we went into in that game with being three down um, in, in the two game aggregate, we always kind of knew that they were going to give us uh, at least a little bit of an invitation to, um, you know, get back those, those three goals and the, and, and probably wait on a counter. Um, I will say though, you know, I, I was a little surprised at club America sitting back as much as they did because they've got so much talent to at least at times in that game to bring it to us. And they really just let us um, completely put the press on the entire first half without, you know, a, a ton of major attempts on their side to, to be offensive minded when, when they clearly could have to close it out one goal, you know, in the first half of the thing would have been done. So anyway, that was at least positive, but overall, you know, we had to at least score one goal in the first half to get any sort of momentum to try to catch up. And it didn't feel like it was, uh, you know, come 30 minutes, you don't get that goal. The pressure was always on. Was never going to happen. Yeah, you know, people said that was such a 
a positive thing for Atlanta United and certainly to win is, is great. Um, um, the goal from the young kid, Conrad, is his name? I can't remember yeah. his name. Uh, in his first ever match, you know, he comes on and he scores a beautiful header. So so that is a real positive. Um, but I, I, I don't see it that way. I, to me, you know, uh, Club, Club America was going through the motions and um, they just allowed it to happen. It shows you that one of the things it does show you is that maybe once upon a time, a Mexican club could go through the motions and still walk right over an MLS club. And that's probably not true anymore. Um, so that's good for good for MLS. And that 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 um, holds true. You know, um, uh, LAFC almost won the title. I don't know if you followed the final, but um so the final ended up being LAFC versus Tigres. Okay. And L- LAFC was leading one nothing in the 60th minute or something like that. And Tigres did end up scoring two goals in the final 30 minutes or whatever oh. to win. But um, it was a real final. Um, and LAFC, I think, despite their struggles in the playoffs, um, has truly been the class of MLS over the last two years. Yeah, I would agree. Um, but of course, in the MLS Cup final, we saw uh, Seattle, who has been to the finals, what, five out of the last six or something crazy like that, four out of the last six uh, years, so- something in that range. I'm, I'm messing it up, but they blew the doors off of uh, who is it that they're playing? Columbus crew? Nag- probably because Nagby wasn't in the game. Because he no, was, I mean, Columbus Crew won the final. You mean? Oh yeah, sorry. Columbus Crew did end up winning the semifinal. Yeah. Um, sorry. Yeah. So the semifinal is what I was the thinking. Semifinals. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. But no, the Columbus um, Crew ended up winning what three nothing, even without Nagby. Um, that you know they they torched uh, the team in that game. So that was I, I watched the highlights of that. I didn't watch the the full game. Actually, it's interesting. You know, we when we were talking about the coaching search. And I said, you know, why is everybody afraid to, you know, just find a good coach wherever? And I said, even, for example, in the college coaching ranks, right, Um, you know, and there are two coaches who have coached in the MLS coming from the college ranks who had really sort of super success in the college ranks. Um, one was, of course, Bruce Arena before MLS even existed. And then he became, you know, he's still by far the most successful MLS coach. Um, and he did it once again. I mean, what he has done with New England, I mean, taking that as a bottom dweller and yeah. making them in the playoffs is just stunning. Um, but the other coach is uh, Caleb Porter, who won the title with Nogby at Akron, of all places, and then moved to the MLS, did really well initially with Portland. Um, then had a little bit of struggle. They got rid of him, but then, you know, pops up again in Columbus and, oh, they win the title. Um, so that's what I was saying. Um, you know, we shouldn't be afraid just to find a coach who's successful. That's when, when I was originally talking about Paul Riley, who might have been a controversial coach because he's coached in the women's game for so long now. But a winning coach is a winning coach, in my opinion. Yeah. And I think Caleb Porter proved that at Columbus. Um, you know, they... It's interesting, you know, uh, it's, a, it's a story for another day, but, you know, Burhalter as the national team coach is not, I'm not a big fan of. And at Columbus, he never did that well. Um, and granted, they have made a little bit more of investment. They brought in the Mexican player, but, um, you know, suddenly Burhalter leaves, right? And P- Porter comes in and, right, and they win the title, right? So, yeah. um hmm. You know, why can't we take the coach who wins the title rather than a coach who occasionally makes the playoffs as our national team coach? Yeah. One other random game I'll bring up is, yeah, sorry, the, the fire's crackling here, um, nice. is the U.S. men's national team, which is pretty much made up of all MLS players uh, against a very, very weak, uh, what, what was the side that we were playing? Trinidad? Trinidad, Jamaica, I can't, Jamaica, maybe I can't remember. Yeah, yeah. It, I don't even think it was Jamaica. It was somebody even, even, uh, you know, more expected that we would we would win. I didn't watch the game. That's why. I don't and know. yeah, we we should have won. You know, seven nothing like we did. Um, but what's his name from Orlando? Muller um, had a pretty phenomenal game. Looked really good. I think he'll probably end up 
um, you know, potentially somewhere, somewhere else had a really good showing, but anyway, it was, it was good to at least see some of those players actually not, not botch the moment, which the U S men's national team is fully capable of. Well, we're starting to have a little bit of a, a revolution, you know, I mean, the U S national team players in Europe, you know, Weston McKen- McKenney, McKenney yeah. is now starting for Juventus. Yeah. Right. And of course, Pino is, is starting for Barcelona. He's getting mm-hmm. real time there. And Gio Reyna is starting for Dortmund. Right. So, so not only are these players starting for huge clubs in Europe, but those players, they're all under 23. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, so we actually, the future looks bright. Um, I don't think for the next world cup, a, because I think Burhalter is trash and B, because they're too young at this point, but maybe four years after that. Yeah, I think the the homecoming, you know, World Cup here in, in North America is going to be a pretty awesome thing. I mean, you've got home home turf advantage. Um, and, yeah, the, the, you know, the class that we have now that's extremely young to go into that World Cup looks phenomenal. But who knows who the people are that are, you know, three, four years behind them right now that haven't even come on the radar that are going to be available to pick from. And, yeah, I agree. Hopefully somebody else other than Burholter will be making the, making the decision. There's a couple of youngsters at, at smaller clubs in the, Bundes, in the Bundesliga. There's a kid who's, um, play, who's switched to the U.S. national team who's starting at Valencia. I mean, they're all super young. Um, you know, uh, I mean, right now, the sad thing, of course, is Mexico had that sort of moment and they have all those players who are now moving into their prime and they have Tata as a coach and they are a legitimate threat to win the World Cup. Yeah. And Mexico has um, never won a World Cup, right? If my memory serves. Correct. So, yeah, that would be an interesting uh, consolation for Atlanta United fans to see Tata. Uh, but anyway, the – the interview with Heinze, I think one of the things I like from his personality didn't look like he was going to be persuaded by any sort of uh, carrots, right? Like he was very, very frank and, and straightforward with the, you know, the things that you mentioned with not having a relationship with Tata or, uh, you know, Bielsa. I didn't hear that part, not influencing him. He, you can tell he is his own mindset. Like that was really clear from his body language. He's like, mm-hmm. No, man, I'm just me, and I'm coming in here doing my thing. And that was a very positive sign for me, just reading body language where, you know, Frank DeBoer was a little more suave. He's playing the the part a little bit almost where I didn't sense that at all where, again, DeBoer was coming in with a lot of pressure on him as well because of uh, his his two previous, you know, uh, stints and – you know, this guy has got a winning track record. He's young. He's, you know, not going to be persuaded. And I think, hell, if he's only here for two years and he instills some sort of confidence and system and some simple changes, I think we're going to, we're going to see some, see some better soccer and definitely some trophies. I really love the stuff that he, you know, the clips, the, the, the games that I watched from Velez and it was only two or three games, but um I love the way the side played. My only thing that I'm slightly concerned about um, is, you know, apparently he's a no-nonsense guy, right? And apparently he can sometimes ride players hard. Now, it seems like the players that played for him really liked him. So, but it's a small sample size. And so one thing, you know, the one thing, there's two aspects of managing. One is obviously the tactical side and coaching, but the other is the man management. You've got to have people who, you know, want to play for you. So um, that's my only slight concern. You know, maybe if I was, you know, as I said before, I might give the signing a a nine, which is extremely high for, for me, but maybe not a 10 because there's a slight concern about, you know, his, you know, offensive track record and maybe slight concern about him being no nonsense. Yeah. And I think, you know, DeBoer is obviously no nonsense, particularly like the, the beginning, you heard all this, the stuff with him being everybody's on time and, you know, he had very much that Dutch style of, you know, this, this is the system. Right. And that didn't jive very well with a lot of the South American players with that. They like to have the last part of practice to, to mess around and all that. And that just wasn't part of his, 
his way. But I think that's where having an Argentinian coach to understand a little of the culture that we have with the South American players to have a more disciplined approach, but also understand the cultural aspects that DeBoer probably just didn't uh, with the players that we had. Sure. Apparently Heinz is the Heinz's practices are brutal though. He just like, you got to bring it every day in practice and they Love it. battle. Cause yeah, I mean, that's what Escobar needs. He knows he needs a battle every time he's on the field because sometimes he just goes into sleep mode and other times you see, see what he's capable of and, but it's, it's uh, you know, particularly the last year with him, it's been a flip of the coin on what, what Escobar you're going to get. The well, tale of two Escobars, to, that's a good documentary, by the way. Players have to play with a certain amount of joy. Unless you're having fun, you never play up to your potential. And, you know, fun doesn't mean the coach has to be, you know, lighthearted all the time. There's a lot of coaches who are very no-nonsense. But, you know, you have to be able to – know that you can try something and make a mistake so there's there's a difference between being no nonsense and being you know um crazy in some respect you know Mourinho for example who had so much success early I think he flipped a gasket and he's gone to crazy where he now is so concerned about some player making a mistake in his perfect view of football that the players are you know they get scared and scared you know, to do things and the players don't come through under him or improve because they're scared. Um, And you can't have that. Right. I think DeBoer had that a little bit in terms of, I don't think the players were scared of him, you know, in terms of his, you know, personality or whatever, but they were a little bit scared because he constantly pointed out that, you know, perfection, you got to keep the ball, all this stuff. And there was a little bit of, you know, there was a, you could tell when the team played, even when the team was playing well, um, not, you know, this year, but the previous year where we almost went to the MLS final again. Um, the, the players lacked a certain amount of joy. Yeah. Um, and it showed on the field. Yeah. I mean, and with the Bielsa comparison, because uh, Manchester United with your badge there put – put a pretty good licking on Leeds United the other day with uh, their just constant commitment to play the way they play and really not change script too much because that's just really how they're designed and they'll, they'll take the wins they get and they'll take the the losses they get with that system. It does seem like everybody's happy, but the fact that those guys can run the way they do for 90 minutes, you're talking about Heinze having a, a brutal um, system of, of, you know, whatever his, his system is, I don't even know what it is, but Bielsa is clearly known for his just unbelievable restrictions on weight and fitness and hitting certain benchmarks that if you don't hit, you're just not even a consideration for the starting lineup. Um, So I'm curious, like what he may say, he doesn't have any of those philosophies, but I'm curious what philosophies he does have. If he does have a reputation of being brutal to your point. So what, what do you see there that, or have you heard of that might, might follow a similar style? Well, I've heard he's practical. I mean, the problem with Bielsa is that he's not practical. I know. <laughs> the players I get, get better, get better at under him and they love playing for him. People say, you know, all these players say that he changed my career or whatever, but outside of his early stint in South America, he hasn't been very successful as a coach. I mean, he's been mixed. Right. Um, you know, even at Leeds, you know, he got them promoted in the first time of asking, you know, so great, you know, fantastic. And then they zoomed right up the table and people said, oh, could they be even contender, which would be crazy. But then, you know, recently they've hit a hard patch and now they've, you know, gotten some like crushed a couple of times. So um, <laughs> he doesn't seem like the most practical coach. He Where doesn't. Is- but if, if, you are, does. if you are a fan of football. It, right, like just watching that Leeds Manchester United game, I don't have a horse in that game, and and pretty much every other Leeds game this entire season has just as been a joy as a fan yeah, of football. So if you're out there and you don't watch the EPL and you're looking for a team to 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 watch, at least I don't know how long this will be sustainable in the Premier League with Bielsa. There it probably is, but if if they try to, I, you know, I don't know. I do I do There's like the way article. they play. 
There's an article maybe in the Dirty South um, about Atlanta United, and they were saying the the person who wrote the article was saying that, you know, the first season, even though we didn't win a title and we lost in the first round of the playoffs, you know, in penalty kicks, was so much more enjoyable. Not just because it was our first season, there was excitement yeah, around it, read that but just because the team, you know, played and went forward. And even though DeBoer won two trophies, you know, in his first year, it was way more successful season. Um, that first season was was much more enjoyable, and I agree with that. Although there is to a point, right? You know, you if you keep doing these things and you play attacking wise is really fun and successful um but you never really win um you know I, I don't know if you know in basketball but um you know the um what's his name the denver nuggets when they had um this incredible team and rich richman and chris mullen and and um run dmc they called it i think um <laughs> and they 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 you know, were a joy to watch. It was this attacking style and they scored like 140 points a game. It, you know, hasn't been, nobody's come close to that since. Um, and they made the playoffs, but then they got eliminated right away. Um, you can only take that for so long. Eventually you're like, okay, you know, somebody, we want to win too. Yeah, no, so, I, re- you know, I read that yeah. same article. I think it was Rob, Rob Ursay, I think getting his name right, the the writer there. And, yeah, I read through the comments too, and there's a lot of Braves fans that were um, calling out a lot of similarities that you can only take that for so long. And I, and that's where I think, yeah, you have to have both. You have to have a change in style. That's your identity. And we have to – I mean, first and foremost, I, I don't care. One thing I disagree in the article is that we do need trophies. Um, this is a club that should have that expectation every time that we, we get some hardware. And, uh, you yeah, know, there's – what three every year that we can go after. And I guess we are going to be in the champions league again next year because right. of the COVID and, and no uh, open cup happening this year, which means as the defending champs, we move on uh, to, which is, yeah, that is kind of a, a nice little nugget to hold into, uh, into next year. So dear podcast listener, what Mikey Dobbs is talking about is that we quote unquote, won the U.S. Open Cup. Of course, there was no U.S. Open Cup this year because of COVID. But because we won the previous year, the CONCACAF footy gods in all of their wisdom decided that we were still champions of the U.S. (laughs) Open Cup. And we got into the CONCACAF Champions League despite the fact that we didn't qualify by any other means. I mean, not even close. Um, uh, so yes, we're but and, and that's you know good and bad. Um, I mean, I love playing in the Champions League. It also means we're starting the season earlier. Yeah. Um, you know, so there's that. But um, uh, yeah, I like I like more soccer. You know, period. So I love the fact sure. that we're going to get it, another crack at it. Uh, we'll get it with Heinze as as kind of his first introduction into coaching. Uh, you know, again, it feels like in those games we'll get somebody that's probably a central american team in the seedings isn't that typically how it typically works? yeah you get a first round yeah so so i'm gonna ask i'm gonna flip the script on you and i'm gonna ask you a question that i think you've asked me in the past okay um so i mean i don't think that we can truly even having watched the Vela's clips we can't really say what Heinz is going to do here until we see him do what he's going to do here tactically but what we can say is, all right, well, here's our squad. And if you were Darren Eels or Bocanegra or Heinza, um, where is the upgrade that you think that you would make? Um, what do we need? Well, certainly an outside left winger. I, Mole Rainey and who else did we have out there? Somebody that was from uh, New England as an older guy, as a, as a, a Phil – um, of course, George Bellow can can play that winger You're talking role. Talking about the outside back or the outside midfielder? Uh, outside midfielder, because I feel like I don't know. Bello was only in about half the games. Am I wrong on that? But I feel like there was he ended up playing most of them. But yeah, okay. I feel like we saw a lot of Mulraney, which I, I guess that's where I'm going. Like I'd upgrade him. Um, well, they did sign two. They did sign two left backs already. Okay, I I, right? I I read that recently. So tell me a little more about the signings there, because there's also rumors that Bello might be in the market. Um, 
you know, this winter. Um, what, are you, what are your thoughts on that as well? Well, as you know, my opinion of Abello is that it's um, it's got all the talent in the world, especially going forward. But um, defensively, his tactical acumen, his positioning, and maybe that is accentuated by what I thought was terrible coaching by Glass. But um, I thought he was at sixes and sevens defensively. I mean, the number of, you know, for example, if you compare him to Escobar, Right. So Escobar and Bela were both going up the field as outside backs and a lot of times having to scramble back. And that's not their fault. But um, there were a few times when Bela worked his butt off to sprint back 40 yards, get in the box and ran right past an open guy to stand right next to one of the center backs. And then they pass it to his guy and he scored. And you would never see Escobar do that. So, you know, that says to me that Escobar is a much more tactically sound player. Now Escobar is older and, you know, Bello could get there, but if I were scouting Bello for a major European side, I would pass in that not as a defender. Um, I would say, look, you got to go, you got to go play for a smaller side and learn tactically how to defend before you can play for us. And you would certainly think that Bello would be excited about who the coach is given his career and, Playing left back. So, um, anyway, so anyway, you know, I feel like the the left side needs some work just in general. Uh, I like Bello. So I, it's that whole left side that bothers me. Um, the right side with Lennon and Dom, if we retain those two, I don't know if there's been any movement on that. I don't keep up enough, but I feel like those – still here. Yeah. I feel like both of them have upside. I'm still – I'll give I'll give a little more runway for both of those players, particularly under a coach and in, in, in how, uh, how they fit in. I want to see uh, Adam Jean gone, obviously. Mm-hmm. We, need a, we need a legitimate second story. I, I, I would get rid of Kubo too. I, I just didn't see enough from him by – you know, I know these are things that may not be able to happen in reality, given the MLS. I'm just talking about what I would want. I don't think that they produced any, you know, there were too many moments with Kubo where he had sitters and as a, a guy that supposedly has experience in, in the MLS and, and Liga MX, like it just wasn't there anymore. He needs to retire. Um, and, and Adam John has no business playing. That's just my personal opinion. Um, he's not dynamic. He's not doing enough off the ball. And hopefully that won't be an issue most of the season with, with Martinez, but we're going to need depth there no matter what. There's going to be some games where he gets dinged up, hopefully, and we'll have somebody who can come in and get the job done. I know it was a Gallagher um, who we have traded, right? I th- right. I was fine with him, you know, having those mm-hmm. opportunities. I mean, he's he was a you know ray, ray of light in terms of – um, at least his attitude and the way he was playing versus everyone else out there. Barco, I don't know, man. I, I, I was so much a fan of him just in terms of his talent level. And when you see him play on the Argentinian national team on the under 21s, you see what his class is. So I'm just hopeful that if you're going to see it ever with Barco, it's going to be this next year. If not, it's just never going to work ever in Atlanta, period, the end. So if you're not seen in the first two or three months, then that ship has sailed. But I think, again, there's a little, little runway left with Barco. Um, I, yeah, I, I was going to say when you were talking about the left side, I was I was surprised because I was saying, okay, I feel like Barco is the left side midfielder. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. He, you know, yes, because he's in that left offensive attacking midfield side. Um, he's certainly – the only one that's trying to take people on and you need that, but it felt like it was so forced this last year that all you saw was um, the regression of him diving and flopping um, that you saw in his first year. And, and you started to see some of that work out in 2019 where he was, wasn't doing that as much and was actually more productive in in some moments. Um, But yeah, it it is, it is park Barco is part of the problem on that left side. Um, Heinemann, it kind of disappeared again. And so I don't know what his fit is. The um, who, Who's the other um, Latin American guy that we, we brought on? Uh, Joseto? 
Yeah, they have Joseto, they have Marcelino now, um, and well, Mark Mar- too. Marcelino is fabulous, right? Uh, I've seen enough of him to say, dude, I can't wait to see him play <laughs> under under a real system. Um, yeah, all those other midfielders, Hyman, who I think is going to be here for a, a, a little bit more, I think he's got enough runway given – when he does play well, he plays extremely well. Um, when he isn't playing well, he's like just a ghost. Uh, but so is Joseto. So are those, you know, so is um, – who's the other guy you just mentioned? Well, Lopez, we've, I've only seen, a, seen his first game, right, which is Club America. Game, yeah. And uh, – He's supposed to be more of an attacking, you know, almost a forward, but – I'm trying to remember my, my take on him. I mean, there was a few moments where I felt like he – had some bad touches. Um, so I wasn't overly impressed with anything he did in that game, but I don't know. Remind me, what were your thoughts on Lopez? Cause he was the one who was it. He came in. He and, looked super. He looked great in the first half and then he faded in the second half, but in his first game and he's only, you know, 19 or 20 or whatever. Um, so um, it's hard to say. Um, I think your analysis is spot on. I mean, the, the guy, who I think is in big danger is Heinemann. Yeah. Uh, I don't think he's, he's um, good enough. And um, so everything that, uh, you know, what I hear is that um, uh, Heinz wants to bring on this guy from Argentina, from Boca Juniors, Augustin Almendra. Okay. That's the one who everybody is rumored to sign with. And he's going to be, he would be, um, the equivalent of a fourth designated player, um, meaning so right now we have Martinez, Barco, and Marcelino, right? Um, but the rumor is that they they Atlanta United has picked up an extra international slot. Okay. One of the players would move from a designated player to an international slot because we've gotten all this room under the the cap, and that this guy would come in as the as the other guy, right? And He's apparently a box-to-box midfielder, very much in the mold of an Emerson Hindman. Um, but that strikes me. I, again, I think it's a good sign because if I looked at our squad, where's the weakness? I think Emerson Hindman. Yeah. We don't. We you know, we have attacking midfielders: Barco, Rosetto, Marcelino. We have defensive midfielders: um, Re- Remedy, maybe Mo Adams. Um, we don't have a, you know, since Nogby, we haven't had, you know, replacement for that. And Emerson Hyman, to me, um, has been decent, but nothing special. Um, Am I blanking on our number five? Who? Um, I mean, Remedy? Remedy, thank you. He's another one where I'm a little on the fence, too. Um, not because... Well, Remedy of- was terrific under Tata and awful under DeBoer. Yeah, and well, now I mean, it's been a long time since he's been terrific, and at some point, a player has to be terrific on their own. I I, I get it if you have him in in La La Land, but he, even so, I just if you're in La La Land for three years, that's just not good as a player in your in your own growth. And so I just feel like again, his upside is less. And so with he and Hyman being on the hot seat, in my opinion in terms of what they can produce, I, I yep. still scratch my head on him as well. I agree with you. I would have said Hyman and Remedy are, is the weakness yeah. in the team, right? So Jurgen Dam looks class on the outside, or at least, you know, is going to offer an attacking option. Um, you can say, all right, backup striker behind Martinez. Um, but, you know, we have a couple of guys that we brought in, um, Lopez being one of them, Rosetto being another one. Um you know, um, so do you think Rosetta is, is he's he's going to be here for 2021? And you know, I do think he's the type of player with, uh, you know, a Mourinho now in the squad. If you have Barco, you have Martinez, that if there's room for him, and I don't know where that is, like I could see him playing well off of all of it. I mean, how can you not when you have those? four guys of talent at that level around you. So well, he was never given a chance. I mean, yeah. we, we never really saw him get any consistent run in the team to find out. I mean, obviously he didn't impress glass in practice, but um, yeah. 
you know, we didn't we didn't see him on the field yeah. enough to know from our perspective whether he's good. Know, you know, he, he was also, you know, I'm assuming that's the first stint of his life in the United States and, uh, you know, a whole bunch of change happening on top of that in 2020, certainly. So I'm sure that's that's a lot for a lot of these players as well that are coming from foreign places and dealing with with family abroad that, you know, I can't even imagine some of the just, you know, feeling you you only play great when you're feeling really comfortable in your environment, too. And so those are things that I think we can take for granted as fans in Atlanta um, that that we're not really thinking about that from that perspective. So the new kid who scored in the um, against against Club America, um, who so they they dropped um, they dropped our two um, homegrown players. Carlton was gone, um, and um, they signed uh, Jackson Conway, who's 19 years old, and he came on. And he scored, you know, in the first whatever seconds. But um, you know, it's impossible to tell. But you know, good sign. Uh, they they obviously believe it enough. You know, as a backup to Martinez, maybe. Okay. Um, I, we got to get rid of Adam Jean yeah. or, or don't, you know, that's fine. Don't get rid of him. And he can come on for the last seven minutes when you really need right. a headed goal. Yeah, but. I agree. Yeah. I mean, but that was, which is still shocked me why he got so much time this year, because that's the player. That's the only type of player he is, in my opinion, is to come in. But even so, like I, he had enough of those opportunities throughout games where he just wasn't doing that even in, clear opportunities where he's the biggest guy in the field to get up, win the header is a reasonable enough moment for him to do that. And he just wasn't finishing anything. And, and goals yeah. are all confidence and everything. So I know that can shift when you're coming in in better circumstances, but yeah, that's, that's the only reason to keep him. I agree. Yeah. yeah. The new left back is um, Adam Gutman from Cincinnati. Okay. Um, supposed to be quite good. Oh, um, I mean, a lot of people say that, you know, he could beat out um, Bela for the starting left back spot. It also makes me wonder, you know, if you're talking about left winger being a problem, whether or not there's a possibility that Heinz sees Bello maybe as a left winger with a real defender behind him, um, you know, and then Barco moves, you know, into a sort of an attacking midfield role or something. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. So what else? What else uh, should we chat about here? What other topics? I think we've covered it pretty, pretty much, pretty much all. I think the next thing to do is to to see um, see the team play on their hind. No doubt. So when will that first game be? It's typically late February, right? That the CCL games happen, um, and hopefully with the vaccination and less mutation will will move into a spring where the data is is good and i guess that's one thing we haven't talked about is is what do you think um that that timeline looks like for i mean we don't know what we don't know but you know hopefully by summertime there could be some fans in the uh in the stands well if you're allowed to have a third of the capacity and presuming they are Insisting, as usual, on playing CONCACAF at Kennesaw, that means they're allowed to have six people in the stands. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, um, I, I don't know. Um, I don't know. Yeah. I, I don't know where, where we're going to be. Uh, we can only be hopeful that this vaccine starts to take effect. Um, well, that's all I got, Dave. Um, thanks for joining the podcast. I think um, the future is bright with at least some optimism of a, a coach that I think we're confident uh, that could get the job done. And now it's uh, a fresh chapter into 2021 and hope everybody out there has a safe and happy new year. I think, you know, we should end on uh, a little modification of the ATL on fire uh, motto, um, which is, it. um, we know um, a little bit about MLS. We know a fair amount about Atlanta United, but we know a surprisingly large amount about Gabriel Heinze. <laughs> even even how to pronounce it, which is Heinze. Uh, maybe not. Heinze. Yeah. That's all we Heinze. really know. It's Heinze. <laughs> 
on that note. See you right, next everybody. time. Thanks, y'all.